When I was little, around seven years old, I lived with my mom and my sister. We had different dads, but the same mom. My mother and father had separated a couple of years before and lived apart, and my dad lived about two hours away, and I saw him every other weekend. Since the separation, my mom had gone on various dates with different men, but they never really worked out. At this point, I would just like to mention that my mom had drunk a lot of alcohol. She had a hard life, and alcohol had been a way for her to cope with it. I have made my peace with it, and she is a lot better today. One morning, I remember waking up and going into my mom's room and seeing a strange man in bed with her. Nothing unusual, just another date that I would probably never see again. However, since then, the date, John, never really left our lives, and he and my mom ended up dating. John was nice at first. He would let me and my sister, who is six years older than me, stay at his house when my mom did, and he would give us sweets. However, eventually, and I can't really remember when, but John became abusive. Honestly, I was so young, it all feels like a blur now. I can only recall bits and pieces of information, but I remember him and my mom getting into arguments, and he would break stuff around the house, and at points, even hit my mom. Later on, I learned that he did stuff like rip my mom's earrings out and held a samurai sword to her throat. Every time they would get into a fight, he would leave at a stupid time like 3am and my mom would leave a bit later to go after him, I assumed, which would leave me and my sister, then 13 years old, to look after me and get me ready for school. After school, I would walk out to see both John and mom in the car waiting for me and I would feel dread because he would still be in our lives. Now, you would think that would be the creepy part, but no, it's not. You see, John was in an organization slash club for men. I don't want to say the name of it here because of anonymity, but it was all very secretive. He was never allowed to talk about what happened at their meetings to my mom or even us. Women were not allowed to join either. The only time women could join events was the annual ladies event that they often held, which my mom would go to. Around the same time, my nan, who lived very close to us, got into a relationship with a man named Kenny. Kenny was also part of this organization, and him and John were very friendly with each other. My mom strongly believes that Kenny and John knew each other before they knew my nan and mom. Kenny was also very abusive towards my nan, to the point that once he knocked her tooth out. Kenny and John's friendship all came to an end one night, however, when my mom and John were visiting my nan and Kenny, whilst me and my sister were visiting our dads. My mom remembers that she was offering to make Kenny a roast dinner for tomorrow. She then went to the toilet, and when she came back, she heard the conversation between Kenny and John become heated. Before she could even turn around to see what was going on, she felt two punches to the neck. John pushed her and yelled at her to run, and when she turned around, she saw Kenny stabbing John eight times. Somehow, they escaped out the front door with Nan, and it was only then that my mom realized that she had been stabbed in the back of the neck twice. Eventually, the police turned up and Kenny was arrested whilst my mom and John were taken to the hospital. Luckily, they both ended up surviving, but we never did find out the reason why Kenny suddenly became hostile and stabbed my mom and John, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was something to do with the organization they shared. We never saw Kenny again after the court case ended, but we believe he got put into a psychiatric hospital. Apparently, he had pleaded that a mental illness had pushed him to stab them. After Kenny was gone, my nan, who had schizophrenia, came to stay with us for a while until she felt safe and mentally sound to go back home. I really think Kenny did a number on her, and she never was quite right after that. Creepiness Part 2 
Despite Creeper Kenny being gone, John was still around, which didn't make life any easier. He made a life for us instead. He constantly was getting angry, hitting my mom, getting angry at me and my sister. Once, I dropped and broke a pot of mustard on the floor, and I remember my mom and I just froze because we were so terrified at how John would react. My sister being older, she remembered a lot of the creepy things she caught him doing, such as sitting on my bed one night when I was at my dad's. When she asked him what he was doing, he said, where else would I be? My sister walked in on my mom's crying. She asked what was wrong, and John literally said to his 16-year-old, your mom was raped. Another thing he did, he'd make me and my mom go for walks at midnight around the neighborhood if of course we made him angry. My sister cannot remember why, but she once was so terrified and upset at John that she ran out of the house barefoot and ran all the way to her dad's house. It's a 10 minute walk away. When she arrived at her dad's house, John was already waiting there and said, I wanted to make sure you got here okay. That messed my sister up because she left the house before John did and she sprinted to her dad's. The only way he would have made it there before her was if he ran too. My mom became very strange and weird during her time with John, doing things she had never done before, as if she was having a mental breakdown. At the time, we believed it was just because John was abusive and because of the alcohol. However, in recent years she has admitted to us that she believed that John was drugging her. She even ended up marrying him overnight with only two witnesses. Both of them were from the secret organization. She looked drugged up in the wedding photos and we only found out they were married a week later. She never felt right in her time with him and she told us that whenever she went to the ladies night, she would not remember the night in the slightest. One night, John made the creepiest comment towards my sister when she was around 13 years old. They were talking about ladies night and he said, Now that you're old enough, we will buy you a pretty dress and you can come to the ladies night with us. My sister told me that when he said that, she felt so uncomfortable and hated the idea of it and completely refused outright. He made the same comment to me when I was 10 years old saying that when I was a bit older, I could go. I remember being really excited about buying a dress and being able to go to the secret club that my mom often went to, but after learning about how my mom never remembered the ladies night, I'm so glad that I never got the chance to go. I was 11 when I woke up to the sound of my mom screaming. John had passed away. He was diabetic, but was terrible at managing his insulin levels and he had died from too much fluid in his lungs. That was both the worst and best day of my life. I would never wish anyone dead, obviously, but when John passed away, I felt a huge weight lift off my chest. That is an awful thing for an 11 year old to feel. I shiver when I think about what our lives might be like if he was still alive. I wonder if he would have survived. But anyway, Let's never meet again, Kenny and John, not even in the next life. Edit, March 9th, 2018. I just wanted to add something. Once, John got beat up really badly, so badly in fact, that a couple of his ribs broke. John got the police involved, but the culprit was never found. A few months ago, my dad and I were talking he finally admitted that the person that beat up John was my dad's brother. Apparently, everyone knew, even John, but no one told the police because they thought that he deserved it. First, a little bit of background context. I teach first grade in a high poverty area. This is a rough territory that sees a lot of gangs, hard drugs, and prostitution. Just a couple of years ago, the police arrested a woman and several men 
The mom had pimped her two special needs daughters to the men for money to buy drugs. Suffice to say, this is not a good area to be alone in, especially after dark. Anyway, it was early September and I had a new student. I'll call her Grace. She was very timid, she had low self-confidence, and she always seemed very nervous. I kept a very close watch on her because I know these can be warning signs of abuse. One Monday, as I took my class outside to play, I noticed strange looking marks on Grace's legs. Little round indentations marched from her calves to her thighs. She was in shorts. The spots were red and looked pretty painful. I thought she might have some kind of skin rash, so I asked her how she got the marks. Grace told me, in a nonchalant way, that I was being bad after school on Friday, so daddy had to take the brush to me again. I was dumbfounded and honestly a little confused. A brush? Then I understood. Her father had beaten her with a bristle brush hard enough to leave indentations on her skin two days later. Now I'm a mandated reporter and I take it seriously. I called CPS and they were there that afternoon to talk to Grace and photograph her injuries. At that point, I am out of the picture and CPS takes over. I don't get updates on the situation, so I had no idea what happened. Grace never returned to school, but her father did. He showed up one evening as I was preparing to leave the school, about 5.30. He parked his truck in such a way that I could not move my car. Then he jumped out, carrying a baseball bat. He would proceed to scream expletives at me about how I'd terrified his daughter because she was in custody, how I was a noisy bitch who didn't know my own goddamn place, and how he was going to show me exactly what bitches like you deserve. He meant it too. The man had the cold eyes of a fish, and I knew if he could, he would do serious harm to me, and I didn't know what to do. I couldn't run from him. He was massive and had at least a hundred pounds on me, all muscle. If I locked myself in my car, I'd be a sitting duck while he smashed the windows in with the bat. So I said goodbye to my dignity and I started screaming for help. Now, I'm petty, but years of teaching has given me the lung power of a megaphone and I can be loud. People across the street had heard me and came out to see what was happening. The great part of working in a small community is that you know everyone and they know you, especially if you're a teacher. A couple of fathers of former students came over to help while a nearby woman dialed 911. He never did calm down. He kept screaming about all the things he was going to do to me for turning him in to CPS. Even when the police arrived, he continued on with his tirade. They arrested him, but I'm not sure what the charges were. I don't think they can get him for assault since he never actually touched me. For the rest of the school year, I had an armed escort to my car after school. Again, this is a small community and our police officers are wonderful people. Interestingly though, I had someone from one of the local gangs tell me that they were keeping a watch since I had taught his little sister earlier and she liked me. That in itself was a surreal moment. But anyway, crazy dude, let's not meet again. But if we do, next time I'll make sure to be prepared. About 10 years ago, I was fresh out of college and I was trying to figure out what was next. I went to college on an athletic scholarship and I was just as interested in enjoying my college experience as I was in completing it. I ended up with a communications degree, average grades, and no experience. I was working as a door host, a bouncer at a smaller bar slash lounge in a casino. I worked at said bar Wednesday to Sunday from about 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. and my job was to greet people that were coming in, checking IDs, 
breaking up fights, and removing people who got out of hand, while of course maintaining a professional as well as friendly manner. There was a man that started coming into the bar on the off nights, Wednesday or Thursday, when it was slow. He would come in both nights one week, and then not come in again for three weeks or so. Then he would do the same thing always on the off nights. Usually he would talk to me a couple of times throughout the night when he was there. Just some normal small talk. It was never awkward. He was always well dressed in a suit, or at least a button up shirt and slacks. He was clean cut. He had an athletic build, no visible tattoos or piercings, and he had a shaved head. Now, I'm not into men, but I would guess he was a good looking man in his late 30s. Well, the night I saw him, the conversation was a bit different. He came in on an off night, like normal, and eventually he came up to talk to me by the door. The conversation started off normal, but eventually he asked me if I enjoyed what I did at the bar. I did the typical, it's not that bad, it's mostly easy, dissembling that I felt was polite conversation. He then asked me how long I planned to be a bouncer, asked if I thought I made enough money, and eventually dragged out of me that no, I didn't particularly enjoy being a bouncer and I didn't know what I was going to do with my future. At this point, he looked me straight in the face and said, Well, you could kill people. While maintaining our eye contact, I paused and waited for some type of joke, or maybe a smile, or something that would turn this into a failed attempt at a joke. But nothing. He seemed 100% serious. There was no smile, no joke, nothing but him staring at me, waiting for me to respond. At this point, I try to tell him the first thing that came to my mind. I'm pretty sure I don't have that skill set for what I think you're suggesting. He then responded by saying, Yeah, but you could learn all that. Think about it. You could travel. You can work once or twice a month. And you can get paid really well. While strangely at that point in my life, it was a sort of intriguing idea. I immediately thought of some sort of police setup and all the shadowy hitman handler betrayal I've seen in every hitman movie. I told him, no, I don't think that's for me. Then he said, okay, and left. I worked there for another year and I never saw him again. And this event took place at college actually, and made me realize just how thin the barrier of a home is. I feel like, as a kid, even a teenager, you feel impenetrable, you feel safe behind a wall and a door. This incident is the first time I've truly realized that the world is a crazy place, and you never really know somebody's true intention. But with that said, here is some background. I come from a pretty okay neighborhood, lower middle class, and not really any violent crimes, just occasional robberies and odd encounters. 20 minutes of a drive away, there is a lot of gang activity, but not really something that I've had to deal with. Mom was always adamant about locking our front and back door, shutting blinds, and keeping windows shut and curtains closed so nobody could see inside. Now, um, I thought she was a bit of a nut, but I obliged her anyway. Keep in mind, I had a close friend about two blocks away from me, whose family always left their door unlocked. Always. I was welcome to come over, and I was told just to let myself in. Multiple times, my friend would invite me over, and I'd scare her. But anyway, on to the story. I was in the second semester of my third year in college, a four hour drive from home, which is kind of a weird location. The college is a small town with only small highways 
which connected to the countryside. The nearest mall is 45 minutes away, and the other side of the college downtown is small one-story overgrown homes, around 30 years old. This town is only on the map due to the college. As a result of my learned sense of safety, which was pretty relaxed, my roommates and I left the door unlocked during the day when we go in and out of our classes. Typically, when I leave, the door is unlocked, and when I come back, I lock it, typically from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Roommates are usually there for at least an hour of that time, so while I was careful, I never really felt unsafe or like our stuff was going to get stolen. I mean, we had a PlayStation 4, as well as a 30-inch plasma TV in full view. Nothing was ever missing, and we had two cats who never seemed to freak out. The apartment my roommates, Quint and Aaron, and I rent out, is on the bottom floor and super old, built in the late 80s, but remodeled, so it's got the standard deadbolt key lock but that's it. In fact, we recently had to get the seals on the door replaced because the wind went right underneath it. The door is crooked and doesn't fully lock. The layout is also important. The front door is in one corner of a living room. At the opposite end is a huge clear glass sliding door that we never open that faces the parking lot, but we obviously have shutters closed across it. My roommate and I use a table right in front of the door to study on. Basically, I wake up around 9, take a shower, go to class, come back around 2, and sit at the table and study. But anyway, it's one night about two and a half weeks before finals, and it's roughly 10pm. I have been working on homework and studying all day and I decide to take a break to get myself something to drink. Some instinctual impulse now seizes me, and I realize that coming home earlier that evening, I hadn't locked the door, so I downed my cup of almond milk and turned the lock, bolt sliding now into place. I then take this time to step into the shower, coming out about 20 minutes later and taking a couple of minutes to change. So around half an hour to 45 minutes elapses by the time I sit back down. Meanwhile, my roommate has come out of the room and is at the table, and for some reason looks freaked out. I ask Quint what's up. Uh, Quint says, is Aaron, who always comes home really late, around 2am, are they home? No, I say, wondering what this was about. Aaron left around 5. Oh, Quint's quiet for a minute. Then, well, something really weird just happened. At this point, I'm not too worried. This college town is quiet, and nothing ever happens. The occasional drunks, sure, and we also have a really rowdy group of international students in this complex. They party every week so I'm assuming it's something along those lines. Someone, someone just tried to enter the apartment, Quint continues, and I just frown. What? You mean like they just turned the knob? I said. Quint responds. Yeah, like legitimately jiggled the doorknob to try and get in. Really hard too. He explains that he had heard someone jiggle the apartment across from us. Then that same person tried our door, at which point, Quint peeked out our peephole as he watched this freak jiggle the same doorknob of the apartment across. The hall is poorly lit, so he didn't make out a face or anything. Then apparently this dude just walks away. Quint says he heard him go up the stairs that run along the outside to the second floor. At this point, I'm kind of freaked out of course. Because it's just me, five foot eight and dumb of ass, and Quint, who is literally a stick of a short person. Basically, I have zero confidence we can take anyone. I'm proud of my dumb luck, because if what Quint said is true, by the way Quint doesn't lie, 
Me locking our door not even an hour prior was divine intervention, but I just try and laugh it off, because in this situation, I must be strong, TM. Quint is super freaked out and hates conversation. Me, it's probably just some drunk dude who either can't find his house or is messing around on a dare. He probably won't come back. Well, oh boy, I wish I was right. But since I said that, the universe just loves to prove me wrong. So at approximately 12.15 a.m., a whole hour or so later, this time I'm present when the doorknob jiggles again. Quint and I just exchange glances, and then after about 10 seconds, it stops. I don't know about you guys, but my mind goes blank. Something like this happens. What do you do? In horror movies, a monster's battering your door. You gear up and wait. What the hell do you do in real life to a person no less? I think about calling the cops. I think about calling my friend across the way so they can come and stay with us for a bit. He's a six foot four dude. But before I can suggest anything, the doorknob jiggles again, this time really, really furiously, for like half a minute. I can tell Quint is actively freaking out. For a split second, I get really mad. Why do we have to deal with this? So I yell, what the hell do you want? Leave us alone. I probably sound super squawky because I was freaked out and acted on impulse. To my credit, the jiggling immediately stops and we hear quick footsteps retreating back up the stairs. I start talking to Quint about possibilities. It could just be a drunk guy ding dong ditch daring kind of a deal, but that doesn't explain the repeated and insisted jiggling. Like, I can't really explain it. It was super weird. What kind of stranger with good intent doesn't knock? and then tries to get into your apartment three separate times. The only thing I can think of was that maybe he wanted something and didn't want us to know, but nothing good comes out of that. Plus, he could have tested the door when it happened to be unlocked during the day and figured it might be the same way during the night. At this point though, I am feeling really unsafe. I am keeping my cool because somebody has to although my rational brain is freaking out. I check the deadbolt. I then try to slide it further and then make sure the blinds are properly covering the big glass doors so that nobody can see in. I then proceed to look up the local police department and I get the phone ready and even wonder if we should dial 911. Quint says he won't be able to sleep at this point and I feel like our small apartment has turned into a cage. I felt a real sense of danger, but it wasn't really immediate or direct. It was just, there was a weird sensation, as if I had entered an alternate dimension. Well, fast forward about half an hour. We finally relaxed a bit, but I noticed Quint keeps regarding the same page in a textbook, and I can't get through my homework whatsoever. So I finally close it out, and I sigh. And then, it happens again. It's around 1.25 a.m. now. This time I jump, fear welling up into anger. The freak this time rattles the door too, and since it's old, I can only hope the lock doesn't break or slip. Go the hell away. Who the hell are you? The doorknob jiggles a little bit more. If you don't stop, I'm calling the cops. We then hear the freak say, N No, no need for cops. I exchange a glance with Quint. So, the freak does speak. I now say, Who the hell are you? What do you want? Freak says, My, my name is Rikash. Of course, I really don't care. I don't know anyone by that name. And I'm sure as hell not opening the door. Quint and I are also really close friends, so I know he doesn't know anyone by that name either. If you don't stop, I'm calling the cops. The freak says, you, you don't need to. 
If you come here one more time, I am calling the cops. Freak, whose name is apparently Rikash, then stops. And for the final time, Quint and I hear his footsteps retreat and then disappear. Well, he doesn't come back. And it takes me a good two hours after the fact to fall asleep. Quint just doesn't go to bed. The rest of the semester, we lock the door at all times, and this never happens again. But with that said, I'm still super shocked about it. I know in my gut, Rikosh didn't have good intentions. I have never met, nor do anyone I've ever met know a guy by the name of Rikosh. So, Rikosh, from the bottom of my heart, screw you. Let's never meet. Not in my dreams not face to face, and never again through the thin barrier of an old door. TLDR. I felt totally safe at college, and then one night this dude keeps jiggling our doorknob and coming back for more. Roommate and I are super freaked out, so through the door I yell at the guy who reveals his name is Rikosh and finally leaves because I threaten to call the cops on him. I lock all the doors, no matter where I'm going now. This happened about five years ago, after my fiance and I had been living in her house for a little over a year. I'm six foot, and I'm about 225 pounds. I've always been naturally muscular, and I'm told I have an intimidating demeanor. My fiance, is five foot two, weighs maybe 130 pounds. Tiny little thing. Our house is a bi-level home where you walk in the front door and there are two half staircases going up to the living room or down to the basement. The only access to our backyard is through the sliding glass door which is in the upstairs living room and down the stairs from our deck. That is important to note. During this time, I partied a lot, way more than I should have. I was between jobs and it was toward the end of the holidays, so my interest in finding a new job wasn't exactly quite what it should have been. Many of these nights I was out partying, I would end up crashing with my friends, which meant my fiancé spent many nights alone with our three dogs. I had a serious problem with substance abuse, primarily alcohol and I'm sad to say I was letting it get the better of me. But fast forward a couple of months later, and I just found a new job that had a random drug and alcohol test, a godsend in hindsight. I had been sober all of two days, and I had begun repairing my relationship with my fiancé. That's when she told me how glad she was that I was sleeping at home again. I thought nothing of it and I kissed her on the head and told her I was too, and that I loved her. Later that night, my fiancé and I were watching TV downstairs. That's when I thought I heard something moving in our backyard. The dogs heard it too, but I dismissed it because they just perked up their ears, but didn't seem too alarmed. A moment later, I hear the noise again, and my fiancé very quickly mutes the TV and gives me a very serious and nervous look. Did you hear that? She asked me, looking very uncomfortable. I told her it's probably just a few of the neighborhood cats playing in her bushes, as there are quite a few outdoor cats living in the area. But she shook her head and began insisting that this wasn't the case. Now, before I could even ask her what made her so sure, I hear our sliding glass door upstairs fly open. All three of my Great Danes and myself are on our feet in an instant. The dogs let out the most ferocious sounding barks I've ever heard and tore ass up the stairs with me right behind them. As I'm rounding the first set of stairs and the dogs are reaching the top of the second set, I see the sliding glass door slam closed and the silhouette of a man running away. I get to the door and fling it open, and the dog shove me out of the way to chase after this would-be intruder. I grab my flashlight, 
one of those big 4D cell magalites that cops carry with them and run out into the yard. I just made it down the deck stairs. When I see the dogs freaking out to the back fence, I sprint over and jump the fence, just in time to see the man reaching the opposite fence and trying to get over it. He was covered head to toe in black clothing, a thick black hoodie with the hood pulled tight to conceal his face and jet black cargo pants. Without any regard for my personal safety, I charge the man and just barely miss getting a hold of him as he makes it over the fence. Once more I follow him over and come around the front of my neighbor's house just in time to see him hop into an old beaten up pickup and speed away. I watch for a moment as he tears out of the neighborhood and disappears into the night. I run back home as fast as I can so I can check up on my fiance and make sure that she's okay. When I walked into the house, she was sitting in the upstairs living room, surrounded by all three of our Great Danes and clutching the biggest knife we own. She was visibly shaken, but ultimately she is a very strong woman and told me she was ready in case I got into trouble. After calling the cops, giving them statements, and triple checking to make sure every door and window in the house were locked up tight, we decided to watch another movie as neither of us were tired after the adrenaline rush we had just been through. During the movie, I asked her what made her so sure that it just wasn't the cats playing in the yard. What she told me was enough for me to decide it was time to change my whole life. She said that for about a month or so, she had been hearing strange noises coming from all around the house late at night. She would hear footsteps outside and occasionally what sounded like whispering. When I asked her why she never told anyone, she just shook her head and said she didn't know. After hearing this, I came to the realization that whoever this man was, he knew that I was never home at night and that my fiancé essentially was all alone most of the time. Fortunately for us, he somehow missed the fact that we have three Great Danes, and for whatever reason, on this night, he decided not to check and make sure that she was alone again. Since that day, I have been 100% sober from everything, five years total since March, and I have not left my fiancé alone overnight since. Our relationship has never been stronger, and our three Great Danes are three of the best dogs anybody could ask for. In the end, this experience has changed my life completely, for the better. But creepy wannabe rapist slash burglar, whatever you are, let's not meet, for your sake. I work in a restaurant where there's usually only two people working the night shift. We always have a lot of female employees, including myself. Almost all of us are under the age of 18 years old. I'm just giving a better idea of my situation before I begin this story. Two days ago while I was at work, a man came in and went straight to the bathroom. It happens a lot, so I didn't think much of it. 30 minutes later, he emerged from the bathroom and his eyes are red. I had completely forgotten about him by then. When I saw him, I had a weird feeling of unease wash over me. He came up to me and asked what the time we closed at was. He had a very thick Spanish accent and it was hard for me to understand. I told him our closing time and he responded with, I should come back later then and walked out. He then stood in our parking lot for 10 minutes eventually walking over to the nearby grocery store. I was pretty freaked out and told my co-worker what had happened. We both decided to check the bathroom to see why he was in there for so long, and luckily, we didn't find anything strange. We finished up our night on edge though. I ended up texting a friend and told her about the weird encounter. She then showed me a story about a sex trafficking incident that was not even 10 minutes away. After hearing that, I called my parents and asked if they would sit in the parking lot after we closed 
Well, we took out the trash and went to our cars. When I got home, my stepdad told me he saw a man that matched the description who was just sitting by the grocery store nearby. We called the owner of the store and we alerted him. He said he checked the cameras and asked whoever was working that night if they remember him. It turns out he went over there and did some sketchy stuff too. Now I don't know what this man's intentions were, but I've never been scared by a customer like that. From what I saw, I'm pretty sure he was on foot too, which is strange since we're right by a highway. I live in a small town, so the sheriff is going to sit in the parking lot at night until we feel safer. A few summers ago, just before the start of my junior year in college, I decided to take a trip to San Francisco. Since I attended my home state's flagship university, I really needed a brief change of scenery. I have always wanted to be in California, which was convenient as one of my friends was interning in San Francisco and offered to let me stay with her. All the details were worked out and I was so excited to go. My friend was still interning while I visited so she wasn't able to show me around, but I had a blast exploring on my own. I actually spent a majority of my time reading at different parks and even taking pictures as well. She got off at work at 5 so I knew I would head back around then to hang out with her. I always knew I was close to hers when I saw the construction. It was a huge project that required pedestrians to navigate through tunnels. I had been through them many times before, but on that particular day, someone ran up next to me right as we entered the dimly lit passage. He was a larger guy, wearing a white wife beater and blue jeans. I'm usually pretty friendly, but something felt off about him. We awkwardly exchanged, Hey's before I quickened my pace, expecting him to just drift away, but he changed his pace to match mine and kept on lingering. What's your name? He asked. None of your business, I responded without looking at him, hoping he would get the hint. Unfortunately for me, he didn't. You're really pretty. Do you want to go to a party? But before giving me time to even respond, he grabbed my arm he was now pulling me towards the end of the tunnel, and I had no idea what awaited me there. His grip was so incredibly tight, and he was so much bigger than me, but there was no way I could escape by strength alone. But despite being a very tiny person, I didn't have any pepper spray or even self-defense skills. I had never felt so vulnerable in my entire life. My mind was trying to find a way to survive but then I felt someone else pull my other arm from behind. I thought that it was all over, but I looked back and saw that it was a woman around my mom's age. She was dressed in business attire. Needless to say, I was confused. Hey, it's really you. I haven't seen you in so long, she exclaimed. She transitioned into sprinting towards the way she came and pulled me with her. I let out a sigh of relief as I felt his grip now loosen. I was ecstatic to exit the tunnel, and when I looked back, he was now gone. She told me that she saw the guy go after me, and she knew that something was wrong. She walked the remaining block with me to my friend's place. I thanked her for everything, and we hugged before I hurried to tell my friend what had just happened. We never even got to exchange names, but I don't know what I would have done without her. It warms my heart to know that there are people out there who have the courage to help others. I recently moved to San Francisco with some pepper spray, and the construction at the site of the incident has been completed. But even so, I think of her every time I pass by that location. My wife and I were headed back home after a long day of apartment hunting and our soon-to-be new city. We were hungry 
but also broke because we had just gotten married, so we decided to stop at a McDonald's off of the interstate so that we could grab a quick bite. When we got to the front of the line, my wife started to place our order and I felt a tap on my shoulder. I'm naturally a bit cautious since I trained for quite a long time in self-defense, so I quickly snapped my head around and turned to face the person behind me. Out of nowhere, he said, I have kids. I need help. He was dirty, not just his hands or shoes, but I mean everywhere, the type of dirty where the dust and dirt is ingrained into his fibers of his clothes and skin that makes you realize just how clean you are even though you've gone a few days without a shower. Concerned for him, but still cautious, I asked him what was going on and he said that he was traveling with his children and their car broke down. He had spent all of his money to get their car fixed, but they didn't have anywhere to stay for the night. He asked that I follow him to the hotel that was next door and use my car to pay for the room for the night, stating, I don't want you to give me cash because I want you to know that I'm not going to spend the money on anything else. Just follow me to the hotel, see the kids for yourself, and please, please be kind enough to help us out in our time of need. He leaned in close and I could smell the stink of cheap liquor on his breath, but he must have realized that he had leaned in too close and said, Listen, I know that I smell like booze. But you would need some drinks too if you had been walking through cornfields all day. He even showed me his ID with his picture to prove something to me. I obviously didn't want to follow this guy to the hotel, but I was afraid that if I didn't give him some money, he was going to snap. I'm a concealed carry license holder, but it is only valid in my home state, so I wasn't carrying this day. So I told my wife to wait inside near the crowd and to scream if he started acting more strange. I proceeded to go to the ATM machine outside of the door of the McDonald's. I pulled out $20 to give the guy, and when I went back inside, he was playing a song on his phone for my wife, some country song about angels watching over soldiers. He was sniffling and softly singing along to some of the parts of the song, but I gave him the $20 and he instantly snapped out of his sad state and said, Where's the rest? I calmly told him that that's all that I had. It actually was too. Like I said, money was tight. He asked if I had a credit card that he could use, and I told him that I didn't. He then proceeded to make a big deal. Not upset, but very dramatic. He said how this wasn't enough money to get the room for his children, he then left the building and crossed the road to another gas station, but he didn't ask anyone else for money. My wife and I had a terribly unsettled feeling, so we decided to eat our food in the room around a bunch of people. We stared out the windows, and then we saw him again. He stuck his head out from around a different corner of the building, like he was waiting for something. He must have circled all the way back around the building somehow. After a few minutes, he walked through the parking lot and began trying the handles on car doors. Eventually, he gave up and walked to a new gas station. My wife and I took this opportunity to get to our car and get out of there. So, McDonald's guy from Georgia, let's not meet. When I was about 16 years old, I worked at a restaurant as a pianist. It was a nice semi-formal restaurant, not very trendy, but seen as a well-established place where parents would take their graduating children and elderly couples would have date nights, white tablecloths, and fresh flowers on the table. It was a pretty popular place to say the least. It was a great gig especially since I was quite young and my parents would drop me off in the evening twice a week, Friday and Saturday nights. It was an older part of town, the kind of place where you don't go walking at night. I live in South Africa though, 
so you pretty much never walk at night. We have car guards in most South African cities, and while there's sometimes dodgy guys trying to make some quick drug money because they found a reflective vest in the trash, my restaurant had a wonderful guy. His name was Dadi, and he was a huge dude from Zimbabwe. He'd always walk me up the path when my parents dropped me off and come to tell me when my parents had arrived to come pick me up. Part of my pay was a free staff meal, and on this occasion my mother had decided to come in early with me so we could eat together. As we walked in, the owner immediately saw me and dashed over to us, clearly bursting to tell me something. Apparently, earlier that day, a man had come in and asked him if the pianist started at 8 tonight as usual. The owner, his name is Paul, had confirmed yes and asked if he'd want to book a table. He'd said no, and Paul, seeing he looked like he probably couldn't afford to eat there anyway, had asked why he inquired. The man informed him that he had a dream and he was going to come in and marry the pianist. The pianist was his soulmate, and he wasn't going to miss out on this chance to let her know. Quite bewildered at this information, and thinking maybe a friend from school was playing a joke on me. I'd ask what the guy looked like. I remember Paul trying to put it nicely. Well, he was sort of short, 30-ish, plump, long hair. He had a hat on. I had no friends who matched this description, and at this stage I was the only female pianist at the establishment, so my mother and I were quite weirded out. We sat down on the closed-in balcony to order, right by a big window. It was about a quarter to eight, quite dark outside, and I was getting ready to leave the table to start playing. That's when a movement in the shrubs outside the window caught my eye. Mom, I whispered, and she looked over to where I had jerked my head. There, skulking outside the window and watching us, was a short very overweight guy. He was wearing all black, with a dirty black trench coat and a black fedora. He had long dirty stringy hair and a large silver cross hanging around his neck. Now I don't know if it was mostly because I was pretty young and sheltered, but realizing that this strange man knew who I was, what I looked like, thought about me, wanted to marry me, well, it made me feel almost debilitated with fear. My mom, however, quickly realized that while I was in the view of the window, she wasn't. She told me, stay here, and got up and left the table, staying out of view of the man. My mom then went to the manager, got him to phone Dottie on his cell phone. We were sitting towards the back of the restaurant, and Dottie was on the street. After about a minute of sitting there, pretending not to notice the beady-eyed, sweaty-looking man outside, I saw the light of Dottie's torch bouncing off the hedges. Out the corner of my eye, I saw the man start to scuffle around, trying to work out which way to go. I then took this opportunity to stand up and get away from the window. I sat in the back until Dottie came in, as he told me it was okay to then start playing. They never told me whether he ran away, or he had to be removed, or exactly what happened. They wouldn't tell me any details, which sort of just made me more apprehensive. Dottie just said that he wouldn't ever let him back in. He told me that he drove a rusty red small car. I'd later find out it was really old. It was a Fiat Uno. I found out because... Every two weeks or so, on one of the nights I was working, it'd be parked down the street, far away enough from the restaurant that Dottie couldn't make him leave. Sometimes, it was even around the corner, out of eyesight, until we were driving home. I knew the sound of the car, the ratty old exhaust pipe. I knew the number plate as well. Sometimes, when we drove past, I could see a shadow of him in the driver's seat, but sometimes I couldn't. I always wondered where he was then, but from then on, my parents had Dottie's number saved to their phones, 
and my dad would come get me when it was dark. Sometimes when I was waiting to be picked up if we closed early, I started heading down the path to see if my parents were back. Daddy would see me from the gate. Sometimes he beckoned to me to come down and wait with him, and we'd hang out. Sometimes he shook his head. Not yet, sissy. That's when the car would be down the street. I never really saw the man again, so there was never really anything I could do about it. It was always in the back of my mind though. I would continue to work there until my final year of high school and I quit when Dottie moved back to Zimbabwe. So, Dottie, my friend and protector, thank you and creepy black fedora stranger in the rusty red car. Let's not meet. Junior year of high school, my parents got a job offer at a state, and so I was forced to move all across the country. I started a new school late into the academic year, it was about mid-March, and I had a hard time fitting into the new school. All I wanted to do was make a friend, but I was too shy to talk to anyone. It was around this time that my friends left MySpace to join Facebook so I did the same to keep close to them. Some days later, I received a friend request from David. David was a guy that I'd been friends with in my old town. Well, he wasn't exactly my friend, but rather the friend of another friend. My friend Jerry had introduced him to the group and would bring him along every time all of us hung out. We knew that David was a year older than us and that he had gone to a different school. But other than that, we didn't really know anything about him. In fact, we kinda always just referred to him as Jerry's friend because he never even bothered to talk to any of us. So when I received a friend request from him on Facebook, I was more than confused. He had hardly spoken to me when I lived near him. So for him to want to be friends with me after all this time just seemed a little bit strange but I was so lonely and desperate for friends that I really didn't care. Other than that, nothing really seemed off about him, at least not at the time. Looking back, I do remember that he hardly had any pictures or friends when I first accepted his request. But like I said, this was around the time that people had just started using Facebook, so it didn't seem all that weird for him to have such a barren profile. And over the years, his friend list got a lot larger, even more so than mine, so I didn't really think anything of it. But anyway, I digress. I accepted his friend request, and it was just like this that David and I became friends. He told me that he just started university, and that he was lonely because he was way too shy to make any friends. I told him that I was having a hard time in my new school, and it was for the same reasons and we ended up bonding over that. Little by little, we started talking even more. He shared his problems with me, and I shared mine with him. And when it was time for me to apply to university, he even helped me out. He taught me how to sign up for my SATs and ACTs, helped me apply to scholarships, and even paid for one of my application fees, using a Visa gift card so I didn't receive any of his personal information and he didn't receive any of mine. Then, when I finally started university, he helped with that as well. He told me where to buy books, gave me studying tips, provided emotional support. So when he asked for my phone number, I didn't even hesitate to give it to him. David was my best friend, and I wanted to keep him close, even if we were physically away from each other. It was around this time that David started sharing more about his life with me, and all of it was pretty normal stuff. David had a job at Pizza Hut, which he actually hated but needed to keep in order to pay for his bills. He also played soccer, but not for his university or anything. It was just a group of guys that got together on the weekends to unwind. I think the biggest thing he told me was that he had flunked out of university 
and that I was the only one that knew because he was too embarrassed to tell anyone else. And at one point, he also had to move back in with his mom, which he hated a lot. Two, maybe three years into our friendship, my family decides to take a trip back to the city where we had lived prior to moving all across the country, and I excitedly tell him and all my old high school friends. Most of them were pretty excited about the idea of all of us hanging out again, because after high school, we all had just gone our different ways. But when I contacted David about it, he showed a little interest in hanging out with us. I did think it was weird. You know, I wasn't some stranger he had met online, but rather someone who had been in his life for many years. I kept insisting and asking for a reason, and then he finally gave me one. David had told me that his pictures had been heavily edited, and that he was afraid of disappointing me if we met in real life. I told him that it didn't matter what he looked like, and that I just wanted to meet him but he still didn't want to hang out. Instead, he was just starting to become a huge dickhead to me. He knew exactly what buttons to push, knew all of my insecurities, as well as secrets, and he had started using all of that knowledge to hurt me. So, I just stopped talking to him. Fast forward to some weeks later, and I meet my friends as planned, and much to my surprise, I see David there, looking just like he had in his pictures. I didn't understand why he had lied about photoshopping his pictures, or why he had said he didn't want to meet me, only for him to show up at our friend's house, but I was so angry at him that I didn't ask any questions. I just kept waiting for an apology, but David wouldn't approach me. He was treating me like he treated me back when we were in high school. I was really upset, but given that he had been such a huge dick to me, I just figured that this was just another attempt at getting under my skin. We were all drinking and talking about what we were up to, and when it was his time to share, he pretty much just said the same things I already knew about him. He said that he had wished that he was still in university, just like the rest of us, but that he had flunked out and that he was just living with his mom. David said that he was miserable there, and that he wanted to move out, but that his job at Pizza Hut wasn't paying him enough for him to move out on his own. At this point though, I was already pissed off, and the alcohol had given me enough courage to finally ask him why he had been ignoring me. He apologized, but admitted that he had hardly remembered me, which hurt my feelings, but also pissed me off even more. I told him about Facebook, as well as our text messages, and he just kept insisting that he didn't use Facebook. Apparently, he had used MySpace at one point, but he had stopped using that when he had switched over to Tumblr. A Facebook account was something that he hadn't considered making. Well, I asked him about the text messages, and he just said that I had probably confused him with another David because he had never had my number. I thought that denying it was a lousy excuse, but Jerry backed him up, which pissed me off even more. The thing though was that David hadn't just been talking to me on Facebook, but also to a bunch of us as well. So when we kept calling him out on his shit, he just told us to text this David guy so he could prove that it wasn't him. He then set his phone on the table, and I texted him, but no new messages appeared on his phone. Then, while we were all arguing about how we needed to give it some time, the David that I had been talking to for years responds, proving that we had been talking to a fake all along. Things turned pretty awkward at this point, with all of us feeling angry and betrayed, and David obviously feeling extremely violated. So, with all of us wanting answers, we open up our friend's laptop and search for David's profile on Facebook. So, the first thing that David points out is that whoever this was, they were using his mother's maiden name and not his real last name, and that while most of the people on his friends list 
were people that he knew in real life. None of them were people that he had kept in contact with. David's display picture was also of a dog which he had owned years ago, but that had since died, just like the fake David had told me. All measures that, looking back, I'm guessing were used by this person to keep David's close friends from actually finding him on Facebook. The older pictures on Facebook had been taken from his MySpace back when he had still been using that, but most of the newer ones had been taken from his Tumblr, which he apparently uploaded to pretty often. The weirdest thing though, was that there were some pictures he swore he had never seen before. These were all pictures of his soccer games which were taken from the audience, which the fake David had said his brother had taken. The real David said his brother never went to his games, neither did any of his family members or any friends. Further exploring his own fake profile, David pointed out that while a bunch of status updates were of things that had never happened, a lot of them were actually accurate. Whoever this person was, they had been watching David for a very long time. They knew his schedule. They knew what movies he went to, knew what ice cream flavors he liked, knew his favorite bands, knew practically everything about him. We did confront the fake David, but he never answered the text messages and instead deleted the profile before we had the chance to examine it any further. So we never did get any answers. Now, I don't know why that person pretended to be David for so long, or why they even did it in the first place. All I know is that I felt extremely violated for having shared so many private details of my life with him. And of course, I also felt a great deal of pity for the real David. I wondered for the longest time how this person found him, and how they managed to learn so many private details of his life. Then, a few months back, my mother calls me saying that she found a profile with her name, but my pictures were on it. My middle name is my mom's first name, something that very few people know. She thought that I had made a second profile, and I didn't tell her the truth because I didn't want to scare her. But truth was that I didn't even know that profile existed. I've always kept Facebook set to private, and I no longer accept random friend requests, nor do I post my pictures anywhere else. So this profile only had really old pictures of me, and nothing weird like David's soccer game pictures. But it was still active, and he had been active for a while. None of the friends were people that I knew, and none of the updates were of things that I've been doing in real life. So I don't know if the profile belonged to the same person that stalked David, but I'm extremely average looking, so I don't know why anyone would want to use my pictures when there are way prettier girls online. So I'm guessing it had to be him, but I don't know. I just reported the profile and it no longer exists. But I wonder if this person is still pretending to be me or they've moved on to somebody else. This story happened when I was about 5 years old, back in the year 2009. My family and I would travel down to the Jersey Shore every summer. We never had any problems until this one specific trip down there. I did ask my mom to help write this story just to make sure I had the details correct. When I was a child, I was very shy and kept to myself, and to this day I still can't confront people or tell people off without choking up, so I was in complete and utter silence when a girl around the age of seven came up to me and asked me to play with her. I accepted and walked off with a girl to where her toys and stuff were. I didn't tell parents that I was leaving. The part of the beach where she was staying at was pretty far from where I was staying and was around no one. It was at the very edge of the beach and right next to them was a forest. Now that I look back on it, it was very sketchy. 
Her mom was with the sand toys, but they had nothing else. No chairs, no towels, no umbrellas, nothing, nothing but sand toys. But of course, me being the stupid five-year-old I was, I didn't think that this was weird. Me and the girl swam for I don't even know how long before mom called us out. We went to the girl's mom and the mom told her daughter that she forgot to get the chairs and they need to go to the car to get them. How do you forget the chairs? The girl agreed and asked if I wanted to go to the car with them to get the chairs. Again, I was very shy, especially around adults, so I hesitated and said no. The mom then began to put her hand on my shoulder and started leading me to the parking lot. The girl's mom, who still has her hand on my shoulder, she says, Oh, honey, it's okay. We need all the help we can get. We have a lot of stuff. Me, starting to panic at this point. No, I, I think I should get back to my mom. Now, I don't know how, and I don't remember how, but somehow I calmed down and started walking with him willingly. But that's when my mom starts to dart down the beach and then screams my name. Get your hands off my daughter, now. My mom was still fairly far away, but far enough where you wouldn't hear her. The girl's mom deadass ignores my mom, but begins to grab my arm tightly and to walk faster. The next thing that the girl's mom did terrify me, but not then. Girl's mom looks at me while she still practically is pulling me to the parking lot and says, Don't listen to her. Just keep walking. Now I was stupid, but not that stupid. I began to cry and said that I didn't want to help anymore and I just wanted to play with the girl. The girl agreed and she began to look frightened at this point too. My mom would finally catch up to us and she ripped me out of her grasp and ran off. My mom was crying and called my dad to tell him that she found me. I remember looking back at the girl's mom, as well as the girl, and just see the girl's mom staring at me, not moving, just staring. The girl was doing the same, but she looked scared. Looking back, in no way did I blame the girl in this situation. I believe the mom was trying to take me, for God knows why, and she told her daughter to make a friend and bring them back to her. For some reason, I remember being mad at my mom since I just wanted to play with the girl. I never really shared this story before, but I thought I'd write it because the subreddit has a lot of stories of almost being kidnapped, but they are mostly guy kidnappers. So I just want everyone to know that Anyone out there can be dangerous and never walk off with anyone you don't know or don't feel comfortable with. By the way, my mom told me that she was looking for me for about 45 minutes, which means it probably took around 15 minutes to get to the girl's mom. Me and the girl played for about 20 minutes and then 10 minutes of girl's mom trying to convince me to walk with them. I'm only guessing though. I'm not 100% sure. So strange mom trying to convince 5 year old me to go to her car. Let's not meet. Edit. So a lot of people are saying they don't think that girl was actually the daughter, but they both looked very similar. Both looked Hispanic, with brown hair and eyes. But I guess you never truly know. If she wanted to take me, then that probably means that it wasn't her first time doing it. So I'll start with a landscape background so you can better understand this story. My boyfriend and I live in a little house right in the middle of all the businesses in our town. Our backyard is facing a sort of alley and our front yard is facing the main road. There is a parking lot on one side in a strip mall type building with about five or so businesses in it. One summer night, myself, my boyfriend, and his cousin are all sitting in the backyard and we're having a fire as well as a few drinks. Then suddenly, this random older man wanders in our yard 
and asks if he could join us. We didn't have a fence at the time, so we were kind of used to people wandering in trying to join our fun. Most times we just tell them it's a closed party and they will leave without a problem. Sometimes they won't leave, but those are whole other stories. The thing is, this guy mentions he owns the computer store next door, so boyfriend being the neighbory type, tells him he can sit and offers him a beer. It couldn't hurt to know a local business owner, right? Well, like five or ten minutes into him being there, he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out some pills and says, their ecstasy and asks if we want some. We tell him, no thanks buddy, but go hard. And then he starts very persistently trying to push these pills on me. Oh, have some fun, he keeps saying. So this pisses off boyfriend and he tells him to get lost in not so many nice words. Then after that, I see him every day between noon and two of like clockwork. He's walking past my house to the liquor store. He always has his little dog with him and stops at my front yard to let his dog do his business. I think he does this on purpose so he can drive my dogs nuts and get them barking because there's like a thousand other spots for his dog to do so. Anyway, fast forward about a year. I'm home alone waiting for a boyfriend to get home from work. Being a cautious young lady, I always lock my doors when I'm home alone. So it's like 9.30 or 10, and I hear screeching tires outside, and I see headlights kind of shining through the cracks in my curtains, and then I hear yelling. So now I run outside to see exactly what's going on, and it's boyfriend and his cousin. They caught creepy computer guy about two feet away facing my living room window, where I was watching TV. He was trying to peek in at me. Ugh, just retelling this story gives me the creeps. Imagine if I forgot to lock the doors, or even fallen asleep on the couch with my curtains open. I'm not exactly sure what he was up to, but it couldn't have been any good if he was creeping late at night. Now he walks clear across the street to get his beer. He won't even face our house. Now I know this because I stare him down every time, and sometimes I'll open my curtain fast to try and catch him in the act myself. Ugh, freaky. But nevertheless, boyfriend got a security camera, so I'll update if we ever catch that creeper, or any other creeper. A few years ago, I reconnected with an old acquaintance on social media. It started slow. He'd like things that I posted every now and then, which grew to him liking almost everything over the course of a few months. I took it as a cue that he liked me, but was too shy to make a move. It was cute, but not something that I paid much attention to. He generally posted cryptic lyrics, and we didn't have much in common. Around the same time, I started getting the cliché feeling that I was being watched. For reference, at the time I lived in a house in the woods, it would be very easy to hide in the bushes. Our lawnmower wasn't the best, but hey, it worked. You could adjust the height of the grass, and somehow that mechanism broke while my brother was out mowing the lawn, so we ended up with some weird patches of bald grass but it wasn't a big deal. Later that night though, I saw a post from that old acquaintance about patterns in the grass. It seemed like a song lyric, but I couldn't find a song that matched up with it. I didn't think anything of it until I was outside the next day and I realized our lawn had some strange patterns after that mishap. I being the big old paranoid weirdo, I got a bit freaked out. But I try to calm myself down. It was probably nothing, right? Plus what could I even do? It proved nothing. A few nights later I had that same creepy feeling and so I went out on our porch. It's large. There's no easy way to sneak up. We're partially earth berm 
so it's running along the second story and the edge is mostly in the air slash fenced, so I felt safe. I waited, listening for anything, and then I sort of just started yelling. It was sort of like he was there. I said that I thought he was really creepy. I talked about all the terrible things I would do to him if he ever made the mistake of coming near me, and then I went back inside. Now I know it sounds dumb, but then he unfollowed me from all my social media. He stopped liking everything I posted and left me alone. And when I went to his profile, he deleted that song lyric about the patterns in the grass. Maybe it was all completely coincidental. That's what I'd like to believe. Maybe he finally got sick of my ramblings, and that just happened to coincide with my speech. Or maybe he was out there in the woods, watching and listening to me too. Hey there everyone, thanks for watching today's video. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and make sure to leave a comment telling me what you thought. Also, if this is the first time you're joining us on the Creepy Fox Podcast, make sure to subscribe and turn on that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads that are coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to get yourself some Creepy Fox merch, then check right below the video. There are shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it. Go ahead and check it out. Also, if you'd like to go ahead and support the channel too, you can consider becoming a channel member. Channel members get early access to brand new uploads, as well as exclusive videos that aren't available to anyone else. Now with that said, I would like to go ahead and give a thank you to the channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Spunky the Nutcase, Bo, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Dread Archive, Sean, Corey, Jen, and Sylvia. Thank you also to the regular viewers who watch the channel, leave likes, comments, and share the channel with their family and friends. Now with that said, I'll go ahead and see you all in the next episode of the Creepy Fox YouTube Podcast. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.